Hello and welcome back to Will I Vike It? Today I'm at Butter Ancient Farm for their Viking boat burning. As you can see, the boat is behind me if you're watching on YouTube. Um, and my guest is uh, Mark from Two Circle Design. Hello. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, so you're here because you make things from... Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, I'm a, an environmental artist or land artist and I make art, a large, as ideally as large as possible, yeah. out of natural materials. Um, I just happen to grow maybe 30,000 rods of willow every year that I planted like 15 years ago. So yeah. every year, every winter, there's this sort of being in tune with the seasons. It's like going into the water meadows. I've got three locations yeah. um, where I grow willow. Um, and my Rebecca, my wife and I, we've been, go we've been working together for 20 years, right? Yeah. And um, two circles of sign. And we, we cut by hand yeah. all that material and we use it for projects all through the year. Um, not just the, the Vikings Viking longship, which we'll be burning this evening, yeah. but uh, also the Wicker Man um, that gets burnt on this site for Beltane yeah. around May the 1st. It's a really special time for us, my yeah. wife and I. We got married on Beltane, oh, May wow. the 1st. Yeah, we did. So now your anniversary is always going to be. <laughs> always Beltane, yeah. yeah. So um, we got married on Chanctonbury Ring. Oh wow! With uh, like a this druid guy, um, but we had uh, the centre of Chanctonbury Ring was off limits yeah. since the 80, 1987 storm. Yeah. So we cut a few gaps northeast southwest to do a processional route yeah. to get in there. Um, but the, the landowner didn't like that much, so uh, he was he was arrested. Oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> he was arrested. But he said Whoa. he said it's okay. I'll, you know when I was there and I was explaining to the policeman, yeah. I had all my ancestors with me and it was the right thing to do, and they they let him off. Oh, okay. Aggravated That's trespass. Good. I mean, yeah. that was, I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff happened. But anyway, May the first is really significant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, this, these timing, the times and the rhythms of the year yeah. are really important. Yeah. Um, because things grow, things decay. They have a short time. They yeah. li they exist in the time that they're they're there for, and then they they go to nothing. So you've you've changed my line of questioning a little <laughs> Sorry. bit now. No, no, it's fine because because later on I was going to ask you about the sourcing of the materials and yeah. like because especially today everyone's a lot more environmentally conscious. So I was going to ask you about the sourcing of the materials, but obviously you're growing them yourself, uh, as you say, as a natural material. So you're you're having to I guess coppice, a coppice and pollard. So okay. it depends on the variety of the willow. There's like up to four hundred types of willow because they're um, for the scientists among us they're diploid hybrids. They're like copies yeah. and clones of themselves, okay. but they can cross fertilize and yeah. form new strains. So uh, the willow, uh, we grow probably about seven different varieties yeah. that grow from maybe two, one and a half meters up to three or four meters yeah. a year. So depending on what you want to make, whether it's a basket or a large woven structure, yeah. you go to what you need. But then if I need something longer, so I wanted to sew a structure that wants to go all the way over and down again, maybe a yeah. small building or a bender or like a sweat lodge, yeah. um, use hazel. Because hazel is this wonderful material that can grow up to sort of six, seven, eight meters sometimes in, a, in an overstood forest yeah. that hasn't been cut, hasn't been coppice for maybe 20, 30 years. They, all these sun shoots, they go straight up. And they're still only, um, I'm mixing my sizes here, but yeah. it's about an inch and a half. <laughs> Seven, eight meters, yeah. inch and a half diameter. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that, that's really great for structures. And if you want, sometimes you want something to last a lot longer, uh, you sweet chestnut, but anything long and bendy, really. Yeah. So how did you get into making <laughs> structures? So you, so you initially, did you start off deliberately farming this willow? Because you said you planted it. Yeah, I planted, it... This, I planted a large willow bed probably 2005, 2006, um, with the intention of using it to make, make sculptures. Yeah. But my, I grew up in the South Downs National Park, uh, near, a town, near a village called Bosom, south of Chichester. Yeah. And my, I had a really close friend who um, grew up on the side of Bow Hill, where Kingly Vale is. You've got this, sort of yeah. the largest yew forest in Europe. Yeah. I spent all my time up there um, when I was in primary school. Every, every day we'll be around there being sort of Bronze Age, Iron Age, Neolithic people with yeah. our with our staffs just wandering the woods and whittling and and making camps and things like that. So I've yeah. doing, been doing that since I was I don't know since primary school, seven eight years old, making structures. Yeah. And then uh, I went to art school as a painter, 
yeah. um, sort of 90, 92, 1993. And uh, I, I, I finished with a degree in sculpture. So I went from drawing, which mm. is like large scale drawing with charcoal or, or drawing with paint. Yeah. Um, to thinking, well, how with, without the world of virtual reality, back in the early 90s, no real, real virtual reality. So uh, yeah. how do you make your drawings three dimensional? How do you make them real? You make you have to make sculpture. You've got to make you've got to make large woven form, yeah. and it sort of expanded into architecture, and then teaching archaeology, and going into schools, and and sort of all my passions and interests have come together. Yeah, my family um, were also from Singleton. Uh, my mother's side from Singleton. They moved there in seventeen hundred mm. into Singleton. Of course, there's there's the open air museum there this uh, living museum there similar to butts Ranch and farm but up to the 20th century i would say yeah and um, fascinated by the architecture and how things were done mm. traditionally the old ways sometimes looking at the tools or inventing tools that have disappeared within an archaeological record have been quite mm. interesting to do not just the flint but you can grow tools yeah you can grow wooden tools which don't exist in the archaeological record because they've yeah. rotted out you just right, okay, well, let's, let's see what we can do. So if they don't exist, how do you know what to base them on? Yeah, well, there's there's evidence for antler picks yeah. if you want to dig through some chalk. But if you want to furrow the ground and you look mm. at modern tool, modern metal tools now, like a grub axe or yeah. a wide pickaxe or an adze even for yeah. doing chair making or, or boat building, well, you could, if you want to move bits of saw, then you could use a wide piece of wood yeah. grown from maybe a tree that's fallen mm. and then you've got an, you've got the the sun shoot which will be the handle and then you've got this wide piece of wood to work with yeah. you can harden it in the fire things like that and we've tried that and we've used that on buildings here because whenever yeah. i do uh structures on um, butts ranch and farm i'll make a flat surface yeah. i'll try and make a floor surface first yeah. and then build a structure from that there is uh, a couple of buildings in the uh, stone age area on this farm where we've um, covered them with animal skins. Yeah. <laughs> Just having a photo shoot mid podcast. <laughs> Still good. <laughs> Thank um, you. Yeah, so I, I was going to ask you as well. I haven't even looked at my questions yet because we've kind of gone off from what I was planning. Um, I think if you ask me a question and I'll just go off. No, no, that's. And that's then we'll, we'll, my oh, we'll, br oh, we'll bring it back. It's all good. What I was going to ask you, though, is, I guess, initially how you became involved with Butzer itself. Oh, OK. Um, yeah. So during lockdown in 2020, 2021, um, I was artist in resident for the South Downs National Park. Yeah. And that culminated with um, like a like a like a well-being project of getting people into the woods, yeah. into nature, because we needed the space, right? Sure. We yeah. had uh, social distancing and all of that. Mm. So uh, it was about getting people outside in nature and just experience what's there. Um, but they wanted a destination. There mm. was uh, a story about Ascapart the giant. And he was one of the smallest giants of his type. He was like 10 meters, 30 feet high. Um, and he, uh, he was the squire of Bevis the Knight. Um, at uh, reportedly around Southampton. Okay. So at Southampton Bargate, there's like a an archway, yeah. the old city wall entry, and there's some carvings there of Ascapart Park the Giant. Okay. So anyway, rather than doing a whole giant, um, we said, okay, what would need the structure? We want somewhere for people to sit. Um, and there was a giant's chair in Butts Ranch, uh, in Queen Elizabeth's Country Park yeah. in the 1970s and 80s. There was this big chair that people would go to as a destination. So a new destination, temporary destination. There was the, sorry, Ascapart the Giant's head. Yeah. So the head of Ascapart the Giant, with his big head, yeah. <laughs> hid in the woods. And Butts Ranch and Farm, they saw it and said, oh, well, if you can do a head, you can do a whole wicker man. I went, absolutely. Um, but that wasn't my first time um, being involved with Butts Ranch and Farm. Um, we, Rebecca and I, we worked with uh, UCL, University College London, yeah. uh, with their first year archaeology students at West Dean mm. since maybe 2009. Mm. And we would just do a one day Paleolithic house weaving course where they would make a woven hut um, during the day. And then we would then look 
so they would know what to look for when they're on archaeological digs. They can see the post hole evidence, yeah. maybe uh, a, a burnt bit of half in the center or something, and they can maybe the walls had dropped, and then they can see the weaving decay or in, in you know when they're on their uh, digs when they're later life and they're professional archaeologists. So we did that a few times and then it moved to this spot. In fact, the same spot where the boat is. Yeah. And in 2019, we did two structures here. And that was the first time we actually uh, got involved with uh, Butts Arrangement Farm. But I've been coming here since I was a child. Yeah. Not this is like the second or third site. It was on a different location okay. in the nineteen in the nineteen seventies and eighties, a different yeah. location. So I went there as a child, and uh, yeah, I've been fascinated with history and archaeology and architecture and just how people have lived. Yeah, um, ever since. So you're interested. It sounds like <laughs> you're you're quite interested in kind of recreating things, right? So the more um, what are, what's the term for it? Um, experimental archaeology, that kind of thing. Um, and you're currently in the process of building a replica house, aren't you? Honestly? There is. I'm involved with uh, this reconstruction of, uh, it's. I think it's House 1 of Wickdown. Wickdown is, uh, let me think, it's in Cranbourne Chase in Dorset. Know it well? Cranbourne Chase, yes. Yep. And uh, it was, it was, the dig was Martin, oh, I can't remember his name. Anyway, there's an archaeologist called Martin. Called Martin. That's fine. And he uh, did an excavation in the 1980s, and they found, uh, and in the 1990s, maybe 1996. Yeah. And they did. A, they found post oil evidence, which had some really interesting pottery, which also ties into the similar to the pottery in in Ireland. It's a grooved ware. Yeah. And what else can I say about it? Oh yes. <laughs> so looking at these buildings a lot of the reconstructions on farms this, this farm there's a lot of string mm. and if you've ever made string um out of out of nettles or or yeah yeah I have done. or flax it, yeah. it does it is quite time consuming so, yeah. and if you're going to go to that effort just to tie thatch on yeah you you'd have to have a lot of you know a lot of time very time consuming so you could tie it on with willow uh very fresh willow or what we've done with this building is we've made a skin a woven skin of willow mm. and hazel over the whole roof structure and then we've pushed spars in yeah uh, into that weave to hold it using gravity for the thatch and uh, we'll see how long that lasts because ideally the angle of the spars would be going the other way because of the way the water falls yeah but uh we'll we'll see how how wa the water reacts to the roof or how the roof reacts to water is this range. the first time anyone's tried to replicate that? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I have a separate question, which yeah. probably isn't particularly relevant to the podcast. But while I think of it, someone asked me earlier, is that these uh, spikes that you've got coming through the roof, are they going to stay like that or are you cutting them off? At the moment, some, I think at the lower levels, they'll be cut off. Yeah. But higher up, I mean, if this was a technique that was used, mm. it'd, be, it'd be perfect to to push wool against or even like smoke fish i did <laughs> wonder that and like you can like stick your meat up there yeah. and smoke your meat and i guess they might fall off over time if you did that when it's when it's cooked <laughs> it just he stood there all day <laughs> come on it, like that reminds me of my granddad with the pancakes yeah Getting stuck to yeah. the ceiling oh. yeah so back to structures like this yeah I wondered what you thought. I mean, you talked about like the seasons earlier, right? And and growing things. So how does it feel when you have to watch something that you've spent? Because you've spent how many months building this? Oh, this has been about a month, so it's okay. three to four weeks. Because um, the the but the butter the Beltane one is a bit of a bigger project, right? That was uh, four months to to make, and does about it... 25, 30 minutes to burn. And this year, it was. Uh, it was not exactly painful, but it yeah. was it was sad to see him go. Yeah, it's like he, if he had a couple more weeks of people going, is you know, isn't that great? Yeah. Um, but everything has its time. Yeah. Um, things only exist for the time that they're there, and it's a bit like a, a like an opera performance or a, a poetry or someone singing a song. I mean, it's just gone. Sorry, it's there. It exists for that time, and then yeah. it's it's a memory. So, I'm I'm good with that. 
Um, yeah. What I like is seeing how these things burn. It might take longer. Um, specifically, not, not about the burning, but the making of this. Yeah. Um, each um, rib of the boat has been carefully sourced. Yeah. I mean, I, I've been through a, through, through a, a, a hazel coppice yeah. looking for bendy hazel. That's, that's grown in that shape. And there's 60, 60 rods, uh, sails, you could say, or uprights yeah. uh, in there. Probably 1,500 to 2,000 rods of willow, um, which some of it was cut in January. Um, and some of it um, has been used in other projects already. So um, other festivals I've done over the year. I've sort of I've been able to reuse some of the material. So some of this boat's been at Glastonbury Festival. Wow. Some of it's been in Arundel yeah. Festival. Some of it's been inside the gallery in Chichester. Wow. Um, so it's nice to... The, the journey of this boat isn't just from, from, the, from the water meadow to here. It's been all around the country. Yeah. Some of it's been all around the country. The shields uh, were made by uh, myself and my brother. My brother's a prop maker yeah. and he teaches at Chichester College. And uh, he made the shields last year as well and the oars last year. And yeah, I just love collaborating with other artists to make stuff. Yeah. Um, what else can we say about the structure? Well, this year's this boat's unique this year. It's the first time that the public can actually go inside the boat before it's burnt. So there's a platform area at the bow, at the front of the boat. Yeah. Um, probably we can get a large family, maybe eight people. Yeah. Um, can experience being at the front of the of the Viking longship, and uh, maybe have a Titanic moment <laughs> with each other. <laughs> Should we do that after? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, as far as these structures go. Um, I mean, what, what's the biggest thing you've ever made? Is it the... I would say the, the Wicker Man last year, this year, actually, the Beltane 2024 yeah. uh, was the largest structure that we've made um, up till then, 10 metres, I suppose. But yeah. that was uh, that was at an arts festival in Canada yeah. um, in amongst some trees, whereas this, the, the, this Wicker Man was freestanding and you could, you could go in all the way up to the head. Yeah. So, so next year we're thinking, well, we, couldn't we do a wicker man where, where the public can go inside safely? Yeah. And maybe uh, reenact sticking their head and their arms out of various parts. Yeah. Just brings back the film, The Wicker Man. <laughs> yes, it does, <laughs> a bit. it does a bit. I mean, how, how far down the rabbit hole of macabre and celebration can yeah. you go? Hmm. <laughs> so is it, I guess there must be a limit to how high you can go as well, right? I mean... Structurally, there's. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. This guy's there's, the limit. there's a there's a yeah. willow artist in uh, in in Russia, and he's made huge. I mean, much maybe twice the height of the wicker man. Like, incredibly high. Yeah. He uses metal. Yeah. And then with a willow skin, but yeah. you know, I think if it can support its own weight, then you can make anything. Going. Yeah. Yeah. I guess if you set him fire to it, there's a safety limit as well. Yeah rather than a structure. Oh yeah, so the only other question that I was going to ask you is what's the favourite piece you've made over the years? One of the favourite pieces I've made was a, was a collaboration with maybe 1,500 school kids yep. for the spire. It was called the Spire of Peace. It was a nine metre uh, willow spire inside the Chichester Cathedral, mm. north, north transept. And we went into schools and worked with youth groups and young carers, and people with special needs, mm. and the Down syndrome community, mm. and uh, they made paper uh, birds and butterflies, which yeah. decorated the structure. Um, we had a little side room, little woven side room, where people could write messages of peace and thoughts, mm. and then put a, and then stick that to the inside. Yeah. Of but they ended up with thousands and thousands the whole the whole structure was ended up covered up with all these labels it's very moving mm. uh that, that was for the armistice in 2018 yeah it's 100 years from the uh, since the armistice and we did a similar project for the beginning uh, so 100 years since the beginning of the first world war so that was 2014 similarly we went into schools and youth groups and they they traced their hand and they researched people who lived 
in, in their own ancestry a hundred years ago, mm. and that covered a roundabout with these red po- red and white hand shaped poppies across the roundabout. So I think it's not always about it being made of willow. It's yeah. about people coming together as a shared experience to create something that hasn't been before. Yeah. That's really nice. Thank you. Yeah. So as we're open to the public, and I know you, you've got probably yeah. thousands of people that will want to talk to you and ask you similar questions, unless you think I've missed anything, is there anything you would like to cover that I haven't asked you? Well, I'd like to know more about sort of uh, Viking food. Because <laughs> I know that... Tables. Because I know... <laughs> Now, I, you know, as yeah. I said earlier on, you know, I spent a lot of time from West Sussex and from the countryside, and I spent a lot of time as eating berries off trees and eating yeah. nettles, yeah, and so that, and uh, processing haws into like almost like fruit bars sort of thing, yeah, squashing them down, yeah. very delicious. Yeah. But I don't know whether that's like a prehistoric thing or whether that's something that went up to in the Viking so a lot, period. A lot of foraging kind of dies out, I think, once you start to get into farming period. So once you get into like, what, Bronze Age, people start to farm. Obviously, if you're busy tending your animals and your crops, you don't have as much time to go out and forage. But there's no reason to say they wouldn't supplement their diet with with these things. I mean, we have evidence for rose hips and whores and mm-hmm. crab apples, that kind of thing. And it seems hard to imagine that they would then necessarily farm those things they i mean they were yeah around, i wonder if the it? diet was much better and people's teeth much better because there's no sh- real sugar mm, yeah but then there's no dental care right? <laughs> yeah true <laughs> yeah but it, there, there'd be less processed sugar you're right yeah um i don't know it's uh yeah we, once you like I say once you're busy with with farming and that kind of thing i mean you could send the kids out foraging that would be plausible as well yeah yeah I mean, what's something that people do throughout, throughout England at this time of year? They're out there getting blackberries. They're out there getting sloes yeah. and apples. But um, we have more leisure time today than they yeah. had, right? I mean, they would have been busy. Even if you want a loaf of bread, you've got to grind the flour to make the bread. You know, there's, it's a whole process. Yeah. But I think it also, I guess, ties into what you were saying about your willow growing and like working with the seasons, right? So they're having to eat seasonally, you know we can get stuff all year round now but actually they wouldn't have that kind of luxury It'd yeah and be... storage i mean you either eat it before it goes off or find some ingenious way of storing it so yeah it lasts. pickling salting drying yeah. we talked a bit with the house about smoking things on the yeah. roof you know there's uh there are techniques to make things last longer but it's certainly going to be a lot more of a seasonal diet which i guess fits in with your ethos mm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot to summarise in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so there are seven questions that I ask every guest. Sure. And I know you don't know these. Some of these are going to seem a bit strange, probably. Um, but the first one would be, if you had an unlimited budget, what would be your dream project? It doesn't have to be related to what you do. No, I'd, I would... Part of the reason why I got into sculpture stroke archaeology architecture is because i wanted to build i thought if i ever needed to build on a remote island i could build my own house yeah if i needed to so i spent many years working in sort of trades carpentry roofing flooring all kinds of building trades yeah so that if i ever needed to i could mm. so i had this dream that one day i'll buy an island and just build my own place but actually i'm not about being on my own because this community where is where it's at yeah being or taking yourself away from the world is not that beneficial to people's mm. own sort of well-being really you've got to be in a community everyone with their own skill set yeah. i think so if unlimited budget i'd like to do an installation in the in the tate gallery yeah yeah in the turbine hall not had that answer yet no. <laughs> <laughs> excellent all right, so next question. Yeah. Um, do you think you could survive on a Viking Age diet? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. There you go, that was easy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've, uh, I'm, I did, I, there was a time in the, in the 90s, I lived in a bender in the woods, um, and it was lovely in the summer, mm. not so great in the winter. Um, but uh, I, I've got some grounding on what it's like to, 
to forage and live off <laughs> what, what you can find. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, yes, I definitely could. Is there anything you'd miss on a Viking Edge diet? No, no, I'm, no. Well, no, no, I, I tend to, uh, you know, I've got a, a diet of sort of fruit, vegetables and, and fish and meat as it is. I, it's quite simply, I grow quite a lot of my own food yeah. in my garden. So, um, so you're probably not, maybe far. some of the varieties, some of the, some of the vegetables that weren't around, maybe, yeah. I don't know. I mean, oranges and bananas. Definitely none of them. None of those. No. <laughs> um, stuff like tomatoes, potatoes, yeah. chilies. Um, a lot of people pick coffee, chocolate. These are all kind of from the Americas. Yeah. Acorn coffee. We've done acorn yeah, coffee. Yeah, it doesn't taste too bad. No, it's all right. Yeah. It's caffeine free, yeah. but I guess you'd get used to being caffeine free, right? Yeah. It's... So there are alternatives. Yeah. Yeah. But nothing other than bananas and oranges, maybe. Yeah, I do like a bit of tropical fruit. Yeah. Okay, uh, so the next question is, what's the weirdest thing in your kitchen? What's the weirdest thing what, that, you, that you can eat or just in? Just in general. Our kitchen, uh, what's we got? Oh, uh, we got lots of baskets and uh, garlic hanging down with them, verbena. We've got various tea, interesting teas. Yeah. Uh, what else have we got? We've got, uh, we got probably a, a row of, well, weird for people who come round, right? Mm. They'll go, what's in those jars? <laughs> okay. So it's like a line of jars yeah. uh, where we make our own kombu kombucha. Okay. Uh, and they go, That's this looks, this, that looks disgusting. My wife hates the stuff, the Scoobies. I mean, they don't look great. Yeah. But it, oh, you know, we yeah. do we do ours every eight days. Yeah. We put hibiscus in and bulimma verbena and ginger, chamomile tea, a bit of green tea. And it's after eight days, it's sort of slightly fizzy yeah it doesn't you know you can be like really acidic and yeah. um like vinegar yeah if you if you don't get it right but ours is, we got a point where it's like it's lovely it's like elderflower champagne sort of quality i've got so. a friend who uses honey instead of sugar so you mm. get a bit more of a mm. i suppose meaty flavor to yeah. it without being alcohol okay i'll try that yeah so yeah different different sugars can vary the flavors as well i think that sometimes gets overlooked yeah yeah so that's the weirdest culinary thing. I mean, yeah. like I say, with baskets, there's various carved wooden spoons and... Yeah. Mm, yeah. So what's the worst thing you've ever eaten? I once tried, I, I once thought, okay, so with potato, you know, when they, they have the stalks and they, they like, you have the, they go off the eyes, these little white things. Yeah. I thought, well, are these edible, right? Yeah. Disgusting. I don't think they are edible, are they? Well, I discovered that they, they aren't <laughs> edible. They're disgusting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, in fact, you know, they're probably poisonous. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say, I think they might because they're, they're all in the nightshade family. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, so. Um, that's, that's when I realised, you know, that was probably the most disgusting thing I've eaten. Yeah. All right. And there's been various leaves, um, things that I've, I thought, oh, I mean, I, I do lots of nettles mm. and sea beets from the yeah. beach and things like that. But sometimes I'll go, well, I wonder what that's like, and I'll cook it up, and mm. it's like, no, no, this is probably dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like to live life on the edge. <laughs> or on the edge of the hedge. Yeah. yeah. So what's the most memorable meal you've ever had? I think um, fresh sardines from uh, the port uh, down in Valencia. Yeah. Just, just going down to the port and getting fresh sardines and then cooking them up. Uh, my mother lived in Spain for some uh, short time. Um, yeah, just delicious mm. and fresh. Um, I would have said octopus, but I've now gone down the road that octopus are really intelligent and I'm never probably going to eat octopus again. But you know, there's that film, that My Octopus Teacher, and I'm yeah. thinking, no, you're too, mm. you're too cool to be eaten. There's gradually the list is getting smaller because you get like whale and pigs and like yes we go oh they're all intelligent and yeah yeah animals are are smart right yeah um so the very last question the premise is that you've died your family and friends are preparing your grave goods ideal considering we're in front of a Viking longship that's going to get burned this evening um what food and drink do you get to take to the feast of Valhalla oh to drink um a jug of HSB. Um, 
the we're quite close to where the brewery was at Horndean, Horndean Special Brew, HSB. The brewery closed. They stopped producing it, but now it's been bought. Anyway, delicious. My favourite beer. I've been drinking. I don't think I've ever had it. HSB probably it's a like a ruby ale. Yeah, I've been drinking that. I probably. quite like a ruby ale, so I think I'd probably like yeah. it. Yeah. Um, food. I think. Um, my favourite food, my favourite snack is like chickpeas and uh, mackerel. Yeah. Just like fried up so it's all crispy. That's yeah. pretty nice. Lovely. Yeah, that, that'll do me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, do you want to give yourself a quick social media plug, website, anything? All oh, like right, that? yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Mark Anthony Hayden Ford. I'm an environmental artist or land artist, work with natural materials. And uh, for the last 20 years, I've been working with my wife, Rebecca Ford. And we have a, like a company where we go into schools or we, we run arts festivals and travel the world making sculptures out of sticks called Two Circles Design. So on all platforms, Instagram, Facebook, even TikTok, uh, Two Circles Design. Brilliant. Well, thanks for your time today. Thank you. I'm sure you've got better things to do than sit and talk to me as we're in the middle of a festival. But well, uh, yeah, I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. And I'm looking forward to seeing how this boat burns. Yes. So what I'll do now, guys, for those that are watching, I'll put a clip on the end of it burning. All right. And that's where we'll end the episode. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. If you enjoyed the show and want to hear more, remember to like and subscribe and give the show a rating. You can also help keep the show going by becoming a Patreon where you'll get early access to all episodes. Or check out my range of merch on my store. Links are in the episode description. Thanks for watching. <laughs>